Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com, the Liberty Radio Network, and No Agenda Global Radio. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Don't bless me. How are you doing, Nima? I bless yeah, yeah. you, my son. Yeah. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, this is enough. Just talk a little bit. Okay. Talk, talk, talk. Configuration feedback. Current yeah. audio bit rate. Hang yeah. on. Stop. Rolling. Nima. Nima? Listen. Yeah. Everything's trying to pod block us today. I keep doing I one know. thing and then the phone rings and something else happens. How you doing, man? How you doing, I- man? I'm good. Are we, re- are we re- rolling? Or are yeah. We- I want oh, to okay. say, okay. yeah, I want to say that we're being pod blocked. We are, we are. I had to take my shirt off. I put on long sleeves this morning because it was cool. Wow. I forgot that about Texas. In Texas, it'll be like cool in the morning to where you need something long, and then like after two hours, it's like sweaty and hot. And ugh. speaking of uh, things being hot in Texas, my boy Cody Wilson there got written up in the uh, local news as what's what's it say? Like law student attacks heat over three D gun design. Oh, yeah, a track seat, yeah. Uh, well, it wasn't the local news. I thought it was interesting because it was the campus news. It's the Daily Texan, uh, which, you know, I sort of grew up around in college at least. And uh, I, I, I like the Daily Texan, and it was just fun to be on campus again. And the first thing I see is is Cody Wilson sitting there with the Mosin. I was like, badass. He and, pulled out you the know, Mosin. I know I'm taking a lot of responsibility for his rise to um, infamy. Which, you know, he had it all in him. All I did was convinced him that interviews are good and coached him and yeah. was really patient with him, and got him to do an interview. And he's like, I'm never going to do, I'm never going to do an interview. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> and now he's like, Mr. Interview. Um, I also told him to get a Mosin. He didn't have a Mosin at the time. I was like, you need oh, to get really? a Mosin. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what I was yeah. wondering. I was, I was, I was kind of hoping in my heart of hearts that somehow the fiends influenced his Mosinness. And I was I like, sp- nah, Mosin is just a popular gun. And nope. It's cheap, and everybody has one. No, I spread, I Mosin, spread the, wow. I spread the Mosin virus. Was that his first gun? Because I was also wondering. It seemed to me like because the Daily Texan is written by journalism students, so it seemed to me like the the photojournalist on that story was probably like, well, can you hold a gun, you know, for visual effect? And maybe he didn't have a yeah. handgun. Maybe he was just like, uh, all I got's the Mosin. Like, yeah, when I fine. when I talked to him, he had he wasn't really a gun guy. That's the and that's kind of a good thing. I mean, it's, it's like a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I mean, I look at the guy who you know paid for the uh, the the Heller case. He'd never fired a gun in his life. He, Cody had fired a gun and he had a gun. I forget what it was. I think it was not. He did not have a handgun. I think he had an AK or an SKS. Uh, nice. I think it was an AK. Yeah. Um, but you know, he hadn't even really fired it much. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, it's good that he, you know, I guess he's kind of a gun guy. I mean, most people, you know, liberals would be like, he has an AK? How can you call him kind of a gun guy? I know, but, I know, I know. But, but yeah, that's a good thing because, you know, he's he's in it because of what the market wants. And he's in it to push the envelope of human achievement uh, vis-a-vis 3D printing. And that, that makes it a really good uh, heartwarming story of freedom fix, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I I take this as it's not about guns; it's about freedom. And he picked the thing that made sense to rub the edges the wrong way with a lot of yes. people. You know, I mean, I think that if if we were in a Scott Beezer lib pair with guns, but for some reason, um, you know, adding a uh, fuel injector to your car that improved your gas mileage was you know as regulated as guns, I think that's what he'd be three D printing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, I'm just waiting on somebody to 3D print me out uh, a blunt or a joint or a bong or something. <laughs> well, that is I one guess of a the bong would be pretty easy to do, but yeah, a bong would be a, a bong's a tube, man. You could do a tube, yeah, but yeah. um, yeah, th that is one of the possible future applications of that is 3D printers is uh. 3D printers for pharmaceuticals, which could be for drugs too. I mean, basically, nice. there's different ways it could be done. It could have, you know, a bunch of different petrochemicals that would mix when the prescription arrives by via the internet, or you know, so maybe, it would 3D print down to the molecular well, level, is what you're saying. Like it well, would actually I mean, create the chemi the chemicals be, in the be, printer. Yeah, it'd be really easy to have something that would just mix chemicals. I mean, that could be yeah. done right now. But, you know, I've heard it discussed to the point of like, you know, it'll have hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen and like build the molecules. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, with that's those, what I'm asking. With those four things, you can build pretty much most of the most of the recreational drugs and most of the pharmaceutical wow. drugs yeah. out there. That would be amazing. That's, that's what I'm crossing my fingers and waiting on. Um, um, so and and the thing about Cody is in the Daily Texan write up, it didn't seem like he he's taken this sitting down. As as we most most of us know, um, his printer got taken away. Um, and at the end of the story, it says he plans on getting a license and and trying to lease a printer again. They didn't make it clear what they meant by license, though. I'm guessing FFL? maybe an FFL. Yeah, that's what that's the only thing I could think of. Um, which Ugh. I mean. The FFL doesn't have anything to do with gun printing because gun printing is such a new concept. I think it does. I think that, um, you know, an FFL is for selling guns, but I think also to to do some manufacture, home manufacturer guns, you'd need an FFL or they would want you to need an FFL. The thing with his thing is, I heard an interview with him yesterday on some gun podcast. Um, there's a lot of gray areas in what he's doing. He actually yeah, also yeah, that, said... Yeah, that's kind of my point, yeah. He actually said also said that he is... Uh, um, license. He's getting a. He's incorporating in Wyoming. I thought that was interesting. Which is it because of the fire? I don't know, Act? man. I, it's hard to get a hold of him. I wrote him today and asked him for his address to send him the gun training DVD because I think he'd dig mm -hmm. it and could use it. But uh, it, actually, Wyoming incorporation is pretty common. I mean, like other states are really well known for it, like Delaware, like Delaware. Uh -huh. uh, but I think Wyoming is similar to Delaware in the laws with that and people out of state incorporate here. But I think if I, if I were him, I'd, I'd go live in Wyoming and do it. I'm not going to let him stay at my house and do this. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, but, in, uh, in Wyoming, he would be protected by the Farms Freedom Act as long as he, I guess he would have to buy the, the medium that the printer uses inside of Wyoming would be the only catch. You know what he should do is he should go stay at Anthony Bouchard's house and do this. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, protect him. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, mean, I was also thinking maybe... That might be an unholy match made in somewhere uh, in Wyoming. <laughs> in I mean, really, because in Anthony helped tower. push through the Wyoming Firearm Freedom uh -huh. Act, and it's never been tested. Never. And never. It would be wonderful to see it tested on something with as huge of a repercussion as what Cody's doing. I'm going to write Anthony right now. Anthony. There you go. Make it happen. Make it so. Um, so, yeah, I mean... The whole licensing thing to me, though, though, doesn't that just sum up what's wrong with with a system that at this point, you know, is is it really there if, if we're not trying to do something mandated or regulated, it's just assumed that you're not allowed to do it? Because that's what the company was doing. You know, there's no law that says you have to have a license to print a gun or to use a 3D printer to do research, to do R&D on 3D gun printing. But they just assumed that it might be illegal and the company pulled it from them. I think some libertarian billionaires should just buy Cody a freaking printer so he doesn't have to worry about this and he can just own it outright. I just wrote Anthony and sent him the link to this article and said, uh, you should have this guy. Or what if you had this guy come live at your house and test the Wyoming Firearm Freedom Act? You think he'd be down for that? I don't know. I'm just being a punk. Yeah. 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 I mean... Ah. Anthony loves to do activism and he loves to push the envelope. I don't know if, if this is his kind of a deal, but this seems like it'd be something that he would uh, he would enjoy. Yeah. So, moving right along to audio, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Levelator. We did we did a cast recently where uh, you're you weren't loud enough because you were worried about distorting, mm -hmm. so which yeah. we'd had on the previous cast. So it's like I ended a pendulum. up, yeah, I ended up with all these files where, like, I was about, you know, you were about a third as loud as me. So I ran them through the Levelator. The Levelator is a free downloadable 
Uh, it's a great program. It's, it's I like programs that do this. It only does one thing. It does it well. It doesn't have any controls or things on it. You just drop and drag a WAV file or AIFF file into it and it levelates them. It brings the levels of the loud one down a little bit and the quiet ones up a little bit so they're more matched and then outputs a new file. And I just took those files and then did my usual voodoo on them and it worked pretty well. Yeah, it seemed to work really well. It's interesting because when you first on the posted Sunday on the show. blog about Levelator, I was like, when would you ever use that? Would you just <laughs> get it right the first time? Yeah. And uh, I guess that was level. That was the universe's way of letting me know, hey, this is when you would use it. Yep. And uh, let's see. We wrote to the. I wrote to Daniel Nathan, 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 the German man who created Butt. But guy. Yep. Mm -hmm. And asked him if he could add uh, input levels. And he said implementing that wouldn't be a problem. The problem is more that Butt's development has stopped. Oh, his butt has stopped developing. <laughs> and then he says, you use Windows, right? Maybe when having a good a good day in the near future, or I'll implement it. <laughs> Maybe I'll implement it. Maybe no. I will. And then he has a smiley winky, <laughs> winky face, which says I think okay, he will. Okay. Uh, okay. And that's cool, man. It's like I like software developers that, you know, I mean, think about Microsoft or, or Apple. If you wanted a feature added, think about you'd have to get like, 10,000 people to sign a petition and then a year later they do it with but you know <laughs> I just email the guy I'll bet if I emailed him and sent him a hundred dollars it'd be done tomorrow but I don't have it so yeah because yeah. the fiends aren't giving enough donations we really need more fiend donations uh, we need fiend weekly the monthly subscriptions even as little as five dollars a month and we really would like people to go on iTunes and review the freedom fiends and anarchy gumbo and we'd love people to go on to Amazon and review Gun training with the non-aggression principle and guns and weed, the road to freedom. And you get something in return. We'll send you buttons if you become a, a monthly donator. You can get a, a nice free yeah. uh, set of Freedom Fiends buttons, which are awesome. You should have uh, buttons right now today. They should be coming today. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I haven't checked the mail today, but I will do yep. that. Um, another thing you could do if you want to help the fiends out is uh, go check Scott Beezer's Quantum Vibe comic. Um, He's awesome. Um, I, I went through about have you been 80, reading it? 80 panels of it the other day. Nice. It's amazing. Isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, what part are you at right now? Like, uh, did, did she, she just dive into back. the sun yet? She just got back from the sun. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? That was amazing. Diving into the sun. Yeah. Did you ever even imagine that in yeah. your life? I know. Yeah. In lib hair. Yeah, it's like, you know, we're like, well, who would take care of the roads? And like, without the government, we'd be diving into the sun in our <laughs> private spaceships. Yeah. I exactly. still don't understand why she went and nuked the sun. What's the point of that? Uh, well, it was from... It sounds bad. I think, I think the way they explained it was she needed to take some kind of measurements that were relevant to... Uh, her boss's research because he's doing research on, um, you know, other uni not other universes, I guess, other universes, other dimensions. Um, and maybe I think that's where the title is kind of a double entendre, you know, quantum vibe, like not only the vibe, but like the vibration, quantum vibration maybe has something to do with well, that. Well, it's actually explained at some point. I saw the word, the quantum, uh, it's the, it's the research he's doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And, uh, so I think, I think she had to like go into the sun and she like dropped bombs into the sun or something and measured yeah, the explosion. She, she dropped so, 10, 10 nukes into the surface for the right. sun. This, which interesting in lib pair, I wonder like, who would try to stop you from doing that? Because that's kind of, um, you know, that could be if it went awry, terrorism on a, you know, global, not not beyond global level. You know, I mean, you talk about like, well, you know, with the Second Amendment, we should be able to have nukes, and it's like, would you? What if you nuke the sun and put it out? You know, <laughs> I don't think you could put out the sun from nuking it. I mean, the sun is just one. I know big it. It nuke looked, anyway. I know. I mean, it looked like. You know, dropping pies in someone's field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not a big deal. For and there were sun, ten nukes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it was to. Uh, it, it has something to do with an experiment for her <clears throat> boss's research, so he can figure out how to, how to even get away from the solar system, because apparently even that small amount of tyranny in the quantum vibe universe is too much. So you're interviewing Scott Beezer, yes. ry rhymes with geezer. Uh, I'm excited this yeah, week. Yeah. Is that going to come out Saturday or the next Saturday? Do you know? Because uh, I have a a really hot tip coming up. I have an interview tomorrow that I may want to put out this Saturday. Would you mind? Uh, doesn't matter to me. It's up to you. Okay. I mean, I can well, go either way. Let's see how. When is yours? I'm doing the interview on Wednesday. Okay, me too. So we'll talk Wednesday. What time are you doing it at? 
uh, 2 p.m. Central Time. I'm doing mine 2 p.m. my time. Oh, no, 3 p.m. Uh, yeah, so around the same time. So when yeah. when we're done, we should chat. Um, okay. I'm interviewing Dick Dale. Now say, who's that, Michael? He's got a unless, cool name, but, unless but you know I don't who know who is. Dick Dale is. <clears throat> uh, is he a porn star? <laughs> Dick Dale kind of uh, invented loud guitar, among other things. He invented surf music. Uh, oh, by by okay, taking okay. Middle Eastern, uh, he's <clears throat> he is uh, he's Lebanese derivation, born in America. His dad was Lebanese, and he took Middle Eastern modes on the guitar and played them really uh, loud, and it turned into surf music. Um, you probably know a lot of his music. This is the one that was featured in uh, in uh, Pulp, Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Yep. Yep. Nice, nice. This song just kicks so much ass, man. Now, and did he, he also c- come up with the the reverby, echoey sound that surf yeah, music guitar has? Well, he he helped build. He helped Leo Fender build the first hundred watt amp. You know, he's he's not he's known as the king of surf, but he calls himself the king of loud. He was the first guy to play electric guitar really effing loud and with energy, and he actually influenced like. Punk rock, metal, shred guitar. I mean, East Bay Ray from Dead Kennedys plays just like Dick Dale. I mean, he plays okay. very similar music. Hmm. hmm. Now, uh, you know, he's Lebanese. Okay, okay. See, I yeah. always wondered that. I, to me, there was always a connection in my head between surf music and um, an actually coastal Iranian violin. It's not a violin. It's some kind of string instrument they play with a, a bow. I think yeah, it's, a it's the or something. No, not the or. The, well, he actually, this song that he's best known for, Miserlou, he didn't actually write. It, it's a slow, like, it's a Greek song, and it's slow and kind of uh, thoughtful, and he just, like, sped it way up. Ah, it's called Miserlou. Okay. okay. Yeah. Ben Fold actually, uh, on his live Everyone album, covers Ben Folds it. has a, a cover of it. That's really awesome. Yeah. On yeah. piano. But he's a really interesting cat. He's 75 years old. He still tours like 100 dates a year. Wow. Um, he's really energetic. He survived cancer. There's actually this thing in a surf song, I mean, in a Jimi Hendrix song where Jimi Hendrix kind of mumbles under his breath, you'll never, uh-huh. hear, you'll never hear surf music again. And a lot of people took that as a diss of surf music, like Jimi Hendrix was, was saying, I'm here now, surf music's out. Uh-huh. But, it, but it wasn't. It was reverential to Dick Dale because Dick Dale was dying of cancer at the time and survived uh-huh. it. And, you know, that was the 60s. He and outlived Jimi to, Hendrix. Oh, by far. <laughs> by uh, Dick, Dick Dale not only doesn't do drugs or drink, he's anti-drugs and drink. I'm going to ask him about that. Uh, it's going to be interesting because... Like anti for himself in a straight edge way or like anti... I don't want you people... To I know. think it might be the other. I don't know. Um, he's going to be the first guy ever interviewed on Anarchy Gumbo who I don't think is even a minarchist. Um, he's my friend who introduced me to him, mutual friend of ours, uh, Bruce Boel, who used to play drums in my band in San Francisco and is a runs a pizza shop in the same town in Southern California where Dick Dale lives and Dick Dale comes in all the time and gets the organic something pizza so they know each other he gave me his phone number um uh yeah he said he said he's Bruce said Dick has like old hippie politics which I don't know what that means but I'm going to ask him it's mainly going to yeah. be about music I just I'm sick of interviewing uh computer programmers and I really like Dick Dale so I'm going to interview him but he actually uh well, he did things that were kind of straight edge in a way. Interesting. You know, maybe he invented punk rock, metal, and straight edge. It kind of sounds like. Because in the 60s, I mean, Miser Lou's from like 1963. I mean, he was playing hard edge music, inventing yeah. it back then. But um, he, what he used to do in the 60s was he would rent a ballroom and put on shows and pack out a 2,000-seat ballroom with a dress code and with alcohol banned which was unheard of at the time. Um, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine opened up for him and uh, Dick Dale came backstage and yelled at them for smoking pot in their dressing room, which, mm. uh, you know, may like, I don't know. Is that mean he's so the guy who from- invented surf music is a buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could say if it's his show, he has yeah, control of what's yeah. going on. So it's his property Still. for the night. But, Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he wants to outlaw it or what. I mean, he survived cancer. I'm going to talk to him about, you know, my Ah, daughter, my daughter having cancer and how pot helped her. But I'm going to, 
I don't know. I don't want to get in an argument with this Dick Dale. This could be a really interesting interview, yeah, because not only really is could. Dick Dale, but yeah, this is this is the first time where he could have the complete opposite politics of you. Well, and uh, we'll and I see. don't want to. I don't want to argue with the guy, man. I have too much respect for him. Um, Maybe you'll he, teach him something. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty haughty of, of me to think, but it crossed my mind. But no, I'm gonna I'm gonna just see how it goes and talk. I really want to talk about music with him a lot because. I mean, you listen to Dead Kennedys, and it's like Dead Kennedys' guitar style really sounds a lot mm -hmm. like Dick Dale. And East Bay Ray has said in interviews, you know, that he's, uh, yeah. I mean, here, like, let's listen to, you know, let's listen. Ask him what he thinks of um, of modern dubstep sounds. You know, like really loud, super, almost grating uh, synthesizer and bass sounds that almost sound cacophonic, or do sound cacophonic. Ca really loud and obnoxious. Ca 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 cacophonic? Cacophonic. Cacophonic. Yeah. I believe it is. You can call it cacophonic, cacophonic if you want. You and your words. You and your reinvention. Okay, here's Dead Kennedys. This sounds like fucking Dick Dale. Listen. You know, it's it's that single yeah. note, high reverb, powerful, kind of like playing yeah. horn lines on guitar. I mean, before Dick Dale, I mean, there were guitarists who played single note stuff like Les Paul, but he was playing like, you know, herky-durky jazz music. Like, do 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 But before this, like, the role of the guitar was kind of to play chords behind the singer. and mm -hmm. And people played through like, you know, eight watt amps and he got together with leo fender and got the you know 100 watt hurt your ears make them bleed amp and turned it up to 11 and played as so you're saying as he, he, could. he sort of made the guitar part of the main event he made the guitar the main event yeah the main and event. uh yeah and his and his current drummer is his son and his son is like you know 23 or 24 i think um i have this image of like dick dale with with his baby son like <laughs> holding his arms with drumsticks in him, teaching him surf music as a baby. Like, you will be my drummer if you want. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. should be awesome, man. I look forward to that. Yep. So it's going to be a good week for the gumbos. Yeah. Good couple weeks for the gumbo. So we got... Uh, artists, artists this time, not necessarily just yeah. interviews about politics or or even technology this time, but, but art. The essence. <laughs> so back to... Uh, Audio, I want to explain the Alex Jones interruption on our Sunday show. Ah, yeah. Uh, hang on a sec. Let's go sell some things. A science fiction comic adventure from Big Head Press. Quantum Vibe. It's year 2523. There are colonies on Venus, Mars, and Mercury. People travel in bubbles, fly at hyperspeed. With brain implants and artificial gravity. A scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system on a secret mission to find the key to access new frontiers and save liberty quantum vibe there's a robot girl and zany creatures made with genetically engineered features and corporate villains crave the opportunity to steal a profit from mother's ingenuity a scientific genius and his clever assistant set out on an adventure through the solar system on a secret mission Hi, I'm Michael Dean from The Freedom Fiends, and like you, I'm concerned with privacy on the internet. The electronic police state is strangling our previous protections, and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives. That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B O L E H V P N dot net. At the end of our Sunday show last week, today is uh, October 9th, by the way. So this was October 7th. At the end of the show, Alex Jones's show interrupted our show and we started yelling at him. 
Mm. And some people wrote me and they thought like that was just something we staged and played a recording of it because the beginning of that episode. <laughs> Why would we do that? The beginning of that episode, I was interviewed on Emberly's show, Voluntary yeah. Values, at the end of her show, right before our show. And we set it up ahead of time. I did it as a joke where they started talking about my new DVD and I came in and said, this is the central scrutinizer. I can't do it right now. But, um, you know, and so people heard us in, in, being interrupted by Alex Jones at the end and this, this is, is the, the central, central scrutinizer. scrutinizer. And people thought, Oh, that they're just bookending their show with interruptions. This is kind of funny. It was not, it was real. What it was, was, um, I, I mumbled into their show in, in the LRN mumble instead of calling in or doing it by Skype. And Ian set that up and then Ian left the studio because he wasn't on, he's not on on Free Talk Live on Sundays. So he told them, he forgot to tell them to turn that channel off when their show was done. So it was open during our whole show. And they're on the GNC network. Uh, Free Talk Live is on the GNC network and so is Alex Jones. And there was some crossed wire at GNC. Mm -hmm. And like Alex Jones's show started playing over our show the last two minutes of our show. Now I've heard things like that happen before with Free Talk Live where like, you know, you'll get something from GNC interrupting them. Um, and that's what happened with us. And we just, I didn't know what it was. And I started screaming at Alex Jones and calling him a fat little piggy constitution humper. <laughs> Cartman wannabe. Yeah. And you didn't hear it because you'd muted that channel. Then you unmuted it and you heard it. Have you gone back and listened to the whole thing? I did. Yeah. I went back and listened to it. It's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I was worried about that extra channel at the beginning. Like when I first got on, you I was mentioned like, there's it. an extra channel here. I said, don't worry and about it, man. Don't worry about it. Yeah, let's go. Don't worry let's about go. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm just glad that that was the only problem with it was at the the last you know two or three minutes it was alex jones coming on because at least we got some humor out of it you know wouldn't it have been awful if if somehow that crosswire was playing over the channel the whole time i don't know what we would know. have done i think it'd be cool if we were playing over alex jones's show the whole time and didn't know there it. you go there i think we'd go. know by now we'll do it though, in reverse i think there's still a few stragglers who listen to both who haven't progressed in their in their journey from Alex Jones to the Freedom Fiends, they're still caught in the middle, stuck in the middle I mean, with you. I guess Alex has his clowns to the left of me, then. jokers to the right, <laughs> Alex Jonesers to the right. Speaking of uh, Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, I just can't I can't listen to him for too long, or I I don't know, I just feel depressed. I guess I, you're gonna say dirty, but no, depressed. I was, yeah, I was gonna say dirty, but yeah, I think depressed is it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what a lot of people say they like about the fiends is we're not like a lot of other uh, liberty well, the other type thing media is what, where it scares you, right? Right, and and one of the reasons I left the mainstream media is because of the way we tended to sensationalize everything. We were selling fear, and that's sort of what Alex Jones does too. Um, I don't want to sell fear because I don't think fear should be the motivator here's people. what i think i think fear shouldn't be collective and you know you in go. the in the in my new dvd gun training with the non-aggression principle which you can order from me or on amazon um we talk about the cooper color codes which are um training for individual self-defense of like alertness stages you know white is oblivious yellow is calm but looking around Orange is possible threat, you know, and then it goes up from there to like in a fight. Um, mm -hmm. The Department of Homeland Security took that and perverted it into the uh, what is it called? The, th the, the threat level. The, the threat, threat level. level. Yeah. yeah, like they 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 sickened did a sickening thing with something that's helpful and individual and collectivized it to where right. the whole country should be at orange to, at, at red today because of something we can't tell you about. Yeah, yeah, and and the media just pick up on it. Like I, I think right after they did that, like the news stations would actually give updates. You know, today <laughs> the ter terror level is orange. Uh, I think now you only really hear it and see it at airports. They'll still mention it at airports, which is and on American Dad. American Dad, I think uh, does he? Um, yeah, yeah. He's what's his name? Not Steve Smith. His dad. What's the dad? Stan. Stan Smith still has the mm -hmm. little threat level indicator on the refrigerator <laughs> with the arrow you can move over. If the government had their way, we would all have it on a refrigerator you know like a thermometer it'd be like you mandatory. know I, I remember when it came out john stewart joking about it he said um you know and this and and it says that it took them eight months to come up with this and he's like what did they have a, <laughs> did they have a font issue eight months <laughs> eight months yeah this is how I mean, long it, it takes them I mean, to do things it looks man. like something that a kid you know a, a kindergarten teacher would come up with yeah yeah uh 
utterly ridiculous. And and they never explain what they base the information on. And or, what, or how you should think, respond. Or how you should right, respond. How you should respond. And I don't think it has it ever changed. I, I feel like it's been orange ever since. Like, what's the point of having a scale if it's never going to change? It's Alex Jones. Alex Jones is always at like dark purple. I think dark purple. <laughs> He's at black. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or plaid. Plaid. The Homeland Security Advisory System. Okay, it's low, which is green, guarded, uh -huh. which is blue, yellow, which is elevated, high, which is orange, and severe, which is red. I think Alex Jones lives between high and severe. Yeah. yeah. And he, I think he collectivizes fear, you know, which I really right. should be an individual thing that you decide whether you need to have it or not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been it's being phased out. They started phasing it out January twenty seventh, two thousand eleven. But it's not completely oh. phased out yet. I guess not. I guess. Not. I mean, I guess I have I have noticed it less. But I didn't know if that was just me paying less attention or what. But the threat levels, low risk and general risk, have never been used. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Always. So it's always be been afraid. elevated, high or severe. Yeah. Well, the thing about fear, you know. Is it's not empowering. It's the opposite of empowering. And I feel yeah. like at The Fiends, we want you to be empowered. We want you to feel confident and uh, feel like um, you, should, you, you shouldn't be afraid of no government. You I think we be should be afraid of no state. I think we should create our own. It's like how the level that you should be laughing at governments. There you go. There you go. You know, low, guarded, elevated, high, severe. Yeah. Yeah. Red, blushing. Yeah. At the government's embarrassment to society. So... I want to move into uh, talking about I mean, the title for this cast is either one of two things. It's either it's not my fault. A lot of people are wrong or I'm so sick of cyber begging voluntarists. Now, the first one, it's not my fault. A lot of people are wrong came from uh, somebody said on, on Facebook, Michael Dean, you have beef with so many people. I, I can't even keep up with it. And I said, it's not my fault. A lot of people are wrong. <laughs> And uh, that's in general of all the things I have beef with people about. But in specific, we, we've taken beef to a different level. When we say the beef you have isn't like you know I hate somebody because they're gay. It's, yeah, not it's gay, not like it's not like a, it's not a knife fight in the club bathroom after the rap battle. It, it's you have a disagreement with something they're saying, and you're you're making an argument against that, not yeah. necessarily them yeah. as a person. Which, you know, is not to imply I'm perfect. Like, you know, when I was a little kid, when I was like five, I used to joke to my mother, I'm perfect. And she'd grab my hand and she'd look and say, uh, I don't see any holes in your hand, which was her saying, like, only Jesus is perfect. You're not perfect. It was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I know I'm not perfect and I'm open to critique. Uh, you know, recently somebody posted a, a great comment that I left up on uh, YouTube of the gun, of Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. That, or uh, Yeah, it was that one. Somebody said... Um, Everyone should watch this movie, even though the director is an asshole. <laughs> and, you know, I want to be based on my output and I don't care if, if, I, if I'm perceived as an asshole because, the, mm -hmm. it, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you're only as good as your last show. That's what the Rolling yeah. Stones used to say. Uh, and yeah. I think the Grateful yeah. Dead, too. So mm -hmm. um, I want to be as good as our last show. So this is going to be a good show. <laughs> but cyber begging voluntarists. Now, I've seen a lot of this. And I've talked to a lot of people about it. And okay, to me, <clears throat> voluntarism, I'm not a voluntarist because I begrudgingly do pay taxes. Uh, voluntarism, I guess, is working without the system, outside the system. And it's a, it's a strategy to try to collapse the government by not financing it. And I guess people think that, you know, if 1% of 1% of 1% of people don't pay taxes and talk about it on the internet, the military industrial complex and the government will collapse, which... Uh, it's far fetched, but it's a start, I guess. But it is it's, a start. It's not. It's, it's not start. my strategy. And it, if everybody did that, or if uh, a much larger majority. percentage did that, yeah. I mean, it's the I only. Don't, way. I don't even know if it would have to be a majority, but yeah. you know, a nice level, a bigger number than. Well, they clamp down hard on a few people and try to have a chilling effect. I think they already they are, do. but yeah. And you know, like Mark Edge said, you can't really be a voluntarist and an activist. You should be one or the other. It's it's not prudent to. Be a I don't pay taxes person who's bragging on the internet. I don't pay taxes, you know. <laughs> um, right, right. And to just, be specific, just like a gangster never really says that they're gangster. Yeah, they don't want people to. Know or like the doing. Hell's Angels used to say, you know, those who say they aren't, those who say they are aren't, and those those who are 
say something to the effect of like, you know, are you a, are you a one percenter biker? Uh, if you say you are, you probably aren't, and vice mm-hmm. versa. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. like uh, yeah. Or or the first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to be specific, voluntarism is I think often confused as a political outlook like libertarianism but it's not necessarily it's more of a strategy and you Are could you actually about agorism be, i'm confused here because i always heard you talk uh, about agorism uh, uh, that way yeah 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 i'm getting it mixed up and everyone's gonna go like who is this amateur but it's a guy who hasn't had his coffee yet enough coffee so yeah okay agorism i'm and agorism voluntarism and libertarianism are slightly different things but could and anarchism could be um but could work in this title i'm so sick of cyber begging blank um I guess I was on voluntarism because the the example we're going to pick on is a guy. We're not going to name him because I don't want to. There's so many people doing this that I don't want to bash one person by name. But there's a guy who's doing a voluntarist superhero comic, and he's begging for money on uh, Indiegogo. Who I wouldn't deal with because they shut down. You know, Cody our Wilson. friend Cody Wilson's yeah. donations. But you know, they raised about a thousand bucks so far, and. Um, Good for them. My main problem with them and with a lot of people, well, there's a few main problems. One is he said something like um, in his pitch, this lives and dies with you. Like, in other words, kind of guilting you like this ain't going to happen if you don't give mm-hmm. me money, which mm-hmm. I think is bad form because I've um, I've accepted donations for almost everything I've done including the Freedom Fiends, but I've never said to somebody, this isn't going to happen if you don't give me money. You don't and, hold it hostage. Right. And our expenses are about 40 bucks a month right now and they're about covered. Um, but if they weren't, I'd pay them out of pocket. But I've got money now and I'm doing well or fairly well, kind of well. But even when I was starving and living in a piss in the sink, you know, rat hole, making DIY or die, the movie, and traveling around Europe and getting money to do it, um, you know, and part of the money was from selling things not from uh, begging, but even some of it was from, you know, applying for grants from individual organizations, not governments. And uh, I made it happen. And I never said to anybody, this ain't going to happen if you don't give me money. I never held it Mm -hmm. hostage like that. Mm -hmm. My second problem with all of this is I believe it kind of goes back to the AA thing. There's one of the traditions in AA is we are self-supporting through our own contributions, which is why AA, they pass a hat at the meeting. And I think that's a good, a good model um, you know, because basically the reason they do it and they, they say this in the book, the 12 steps and 12 traditions, um, they explain it. So people are really used to alcoholics always asking for a handout. So that what mm-hmm. they feel like is once you get or panhandling or begging their family or stealing or, you know, not paying the rent or whatever to get alcohol, that once you're sober, they feel like you need to change that perception and you don't change that perception by telling people, I'm a recovering alcoholic, or I'm a voluntarist, or I will drink unless you give me money. I'm, or I'm, yeah, or I'm an, (laughs) that's a good point, or I'm an agorist. You know, you, you don't tell them you're sober, you show them you're sober. And, you know, in AA, there's a lot of, uh, there used to be a lot of value put on, like, you know, you get a job, you don't beg anymore. I think now is with the tainting from the recovery industrial welfare complex. I think there's a lot of, like, no, you get sober and then you get on disability, which, a lot of people I knew in San Francisco are still doing. But, well, okay. Uh, so what if somebody came back at you and said, well, Michael, this is just a modern way uh, to get investors easily if you don't know a lot about business and can't go and market this to venture capitalists and find people to invest in it or go public on the stock market like companies do. This is just a simple way for people to uh, show their, their idea to investors and say, hey, would you like to be a part of this project? I'm playing devil's advocate here, Michael. Okay, you're right. Um I'd have I I would co-sign that more if people removed any of the this the lives and dies with you, yeah. which kind of reminds me of what um, Stephen King did. Stephen King, when he first when his publicist said, "There's this thing called the internet, Stephen. You should embrace it." What they came up with was he wrote a book that was internet only and released like three chapters of it free, and then said, "You need to give me donations, and then I'll write each chapter." <laughs> And Stephen King has a lot of fans and some people did it and every chapter he had to get a certain amount of donations for, but it kind of tapered off and he never wrote the last third of the book and people were really pissed because they'd already made all their donations and never uh-huh. got the rest uh-huh. of the book. People called it um, hostage wear. Uh-huh. 
Right. And he eventually, right. like ten years later, um, put the book out in paperback form, and it and it, it's one of his lowest liked books. It's not a it's not a great book, and uh, also like everyone who'd already paid the donations for two thirds of it had to pay the full. They, price they still to had go, to buy the book to buy the yeah. book. And I want you to ask Scott by Beezer about that too, because he's a writer okay. and. Uh, you know, all writers kind of have an opinion of of Stephen King, usually good, well, I, even I if they don't like it. I think you're right him, that the most the, the distasteful thing about cyberbegging is when people threaten to not do the project because I feel like if you're saying that, what you're saying is it's I'm not, not passionate. I'm not <laughs> yeah, as passionate yeah. as this project as I am about getting donations to do the project. I mean, I sold guns to finance guns and weed the road to freedom. Right. If you really are passionate about the project, you're going to make it happen, even yeah. if that means you have to work nights and not see your wife. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I you wrote have to my, bust I, your ass. And, I and, wrote my first novel working a day job and then coming home at night and work, you know, working eight hours a day in an office and then working eight hours a day at night. A lot mm -hmm. of really influential people did. I mean, um, you know, not to compare me to him, but uh, Hemingway, you know, he's a war correspondent. Hemingway went and got shot at and wrote about it for newspapers. You know, that that's a lot less pussy than, please give me money or this won't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess, I, I guess... I felt the same distaste for this kind of cyber begging because of that. Um, but I think, I think putting a blanket statement on it like it's all wrong. I think maybe it has its place and it can be part of a pronged approach. Um, you know, there I'll are never, other examples. I will that, never that, do it. I will never that's, ever. That's fine. Set up uh, an account on Indi India. The gray state folks, and you you mentioned okay. this too. The gray state folks are asking for There's donations. There's a few exceptions. They've, they've done work. They've done it. something fucking amazing on their own before they even started asking for donations. Mm -hmm. The thing that they did, that trailer that they did on their own is better than most full projects done by people after cyber begging for a year. And they did that on their yeah. own. So I like them. I won't even say I'll cut them a break. I'll say, I like what they did. There's three people I like who, who do this. They're one. Kofi is one. Kofi lives in a country where um, the average person working a full-time job makes $1,200 us a year. And he's like spreading libertarianism in a country that's headed socialism to socialism like a speeding freight train. Mm -hmm. And donating like, to Kofi is, is voluntary as foreign aid. It, it really, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he like, you know, ended up with hepatitis from like, and, and couldn't afford, uh, f food, you know, med $80 worth of medicine to save his life. He mm -hmm. finally got yeah. it after months of help, trying to get help. Um, I've helped Kofi. I help pimp Kofi whenever he does anything. And, uh, Kofi's the man. The third person who I co-sign with this is Cody Wilson because Cody Wilson is doing something that's going to change the effing world. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more important than check out this comic or, you know, I'm making a documentary about the libertarian party in, uh, Beast Lick, Wyoming. No. You know, and we didn't ask for donations to make our movies, man. I mean, we just learned how to make movies really cheap. We, just we did made, them. We yeah. made guns and weed for. Okay, my first movie, um, DIY or Die, cost about eight thousand dollars to make, and I did get a five thousand dollar donation for tax. You know, basically, I, I got a tax free status through an umbrella organization, uh, through an arts organization who co. What's the word? Co sponsored it. I forget. And they take like ten percent. A lot of or arts organizations do that. And I wrote proposals and went to the um, went in San Francisco to the uh, foundation center. I've talked about them before, and sent out like a hundred packets on my own dime, and got like a few donations of fifty and a hundred dollars, and got one for five thousand, and you know used it to make the movie. I would have made the movie anyway, and I was making it before that. Um, the Hubert Selby Jr. It'll be better tomorrow. Movie cost about twenty five thousand dollars to make, and uh, some of it came. A little bit of it came from donations. A lot of it came out of my pocket, and I was starving because of it for two years making that movie. I made it back, and then like a little bit more. I mean, I made, I made about eight cents an hour right. for the for the three years I worked on that movie. But but it's the passion that really made the project. And if you're saying something like, "Well, this lives or dies with whether or not you give me money," that doesn't I really say you're not, well. That, I say you're not really say, an artist. Right, right. Uh, I really because, would. Because if you really were an artist, you would be doing the project because you want to see it exist. Artists in the world. make art, man. Artists you want make to art. make the art. You don't. Yeah. And if you couldn't raise the money to pay, you know, the help you need, you would find somebody to do it for free, or to do it for beer, or to do it for some kind of trade. You would figure yeah. out a way to make it happen.
And anybody that wants to know how to do that should go read my book, $30 Film School, even if they're not a filmmaker, because there's a lot in there about motivating people. I mean, I've been criticized heavily by idiots on Amazon saying like, this book tells you how to scam people into working for free. No, it, it tells you how to get people to be involved in a project and want to be involved in a project and it's win-win and everyone feels good about it when they're mm -hmm. done, you know, for something where there's no money. I mean, DIY or Die, there's a couple people on there that were film students. The way I found the, the cameraman for that was I walked around the corner, you know, I walked like a few blocks up the street from my house in San Francisco and listened to art students standing out smoking cigarettes in front of the art school and listened to who was talking about filmmaking and talked them up mm -hmm. and said, I'm making this movie. I don't have a camera, but do you want to be a cameraman on it? And they're like, okay. Yeah. And some of those people, if you go on IMDb, they're only they, credit. They use it on their reel? Oh, their only credit is my movie 10 oh, years later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's before Craigslist. I mean, there's yeah. so many ways to do that kind of stuff now. And, you know, when it comes to art, you know, a lot of times it's how it works as a whole uh, rather than how one specific thing works. Like if it's a comic, uh, I don't care if it's not drawn as amazingly as, you know, the, the current Dale, Marvel in, or anarchy, DC universe. Anarchy in your head, Dale stuff is drawn really pretty poorly. And I'll say that outright. It's one of my favorite comics in the world. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it works. It works. And, and there's you can, stick you can figure tell the stuff. Passion you know, with when a good story, at. with a good story, stick figure stuff works. Yeah. And yeah. I would say, you know, do stick figure stuff that has the story, and then let and then open so or uh, free source it and let other people draw it there for you. Go. And when you free source it, it could be t it could be a number of things. It could be uh, fellow people, fellow travelers, voluntarists who can draw all right and have a passion for it and want to work on your project, and that'd be fine. Or uh, you you could do what you did with with uh, your movie. You know, go find actual artists who are looking for work for their portfolios, and you can do that on Craigslist too. Well, In Craigslist Austin, did e Craigslist did exist when I was making DIY or Die, oh, and, I, okay. and I used it heavily. Yeah. But here in Austin, I go through you know the artistic TV editing, uh, music stuff all the time, and more than half of it is people saying, "Hey, I'm, I've got this project I'm passionate about. I can't afford to pay you anything, but you can put this clip on your reel, or you'll have experience, or you'll meet people, and or you'll get laid. Tons of people, a lot of people got laid, laid working on my projects, or you'll projects. get free lunch. And there's tons of stuff. Free there's lunch. tons of people out there that are." Um, that are just starting out or are learning or are trying something new and they'd be more than willing to help you with projects like this. So it, it, there's there's more than one way to skin a cat. You don't have to raise a certain amount of money to pay your favorite artist or, one, or the one, most professional artist in the world to do your work. A big piece of advice I have uh, when getting people to work free, you mentioned free lunch, is always feed them and always buy them beer, even if it comes out of your pocket. Uh, there's nothing worse than showing up and working seven or eight or ten hours free on someone else's project and starving. And yeah. starving. Yeah, right. buy, you starve you know, for your art. Don't make your helpers starve. Yeah, for your art. and at the end of the day, buy them beer. Don't buy them beer during the day. <laughs> All right, and on that, we're going to go sell some stuff. All right. Ugh, I'm so sick of looking at Steve's wedding pics, and I'm all out of passive-aggressive comments. What else am I supposed to do at work all day? Sick of stalking your ex on Facebook? Yeah. Are you all out of cute cats and autocorrect mishaps to lol at? Duh. Freedom Fiends to the rescue! The Fiends now have a blog. Read all about the latest tyranny today. Dream about lip pair. Laugh while Western civilization collapses. Just click on the cat icon to the right of freedomfiends.com. Freedom Fiends blog. Read it! You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well-crafted blueprint to create an ever-increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing. Buttons! Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for guns and weed the road to freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to FreedomFiends.com and click on the link at the top that says Buttons. Want to contribute to Liberty but short on cash? You can help the Freedom Fiends without even spending a post-1964 dime. Download uTorrent and start seeding Fiends episodes. Follow twitter.com slash fiendtorrents to grab the past episodes and new ones as they post. Leave your computer on seeding the torrents while you're at work or asleep. The more people seeding the Fiends, the more drone-proof we'll be when the boot comes down. That's twitter.com slash fiendtorrents. 
Yeah. So back yeah. to why we hate cyber begging voluntarists, anarchists, libertarians, and agorists. I don't, I don't hate them. I'm more ambivalent than you yeah. about this. You may I don't, hate, I don't hate them. I just am really, uh, I find it really distasteful, especially agorists, because agorism is supposed to be the underground economy where you do it right without government intrusion. And if you're saying you're an agorist and you're begging for money, I mean, it's one thing to like, crash on a friend's floor and, and let him buy you dinner when you're traveling and doing stuff. But another thing to like make it your business plan. And there are people doing this. Uh, well, I got a, re- it, I got a really a deeper question though. What's the difference between an investor and a donor? What do you think well, that is? Interesting because I was looking at Adam Kokesh's website and his donation page is um, speciously marked invest which I think he should really look at because I think you could get in legal trouble for that. It, and investment means you get some kind of return right. back that's, that's previously agreed and, upon. And there's nothing really shown as something you get back. I mean, I think you get a T-shirt if you donate a certain amount, but it's something mm-hmm. like, it's more like you're investing and what you get back is helping Adam Kokesh be on the air. Which And that, that, that can be valid as long as it's made explicit. And it's really not. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and... You know, I mean, I got a compliment on you on this. Nikki Darling, who is also disgusted with all this, as I am, said, and props to Nima for delivering pizza instead of virtually panhandling. <laughs> yeah, man, I need gear and um, got to go get that gear. So I, I got to get the money. I know. And we do yeah. ask for donations, but there's never going to be a thing unless we're completely joking of you know, this lives and dies without you. I mean, we'll donate and say oh. like, we say <laughs> over the top things like, you will be your life will be spared if you donate when we are libertarian tyrants of the world and if anyone mm-hmm. believes we're serious about that we're not yeah. gonna sp- we're not going to spare your life we're joking I mean, no i'm kidding it, it, it's a dream to be able to make uh you know all the money we need uh and more doing doing liberty media and that's what we're working towards but i think the way you work towards that is you consistently put out product uh and that helps not only with you know building followers but it also helps you hone your craft right if you do yeah. a million if you put a hundred thousand hours or ten thousand hours in for free eventually you'll be an expert at it and you'll and people will want to pay you yeah and even after you're an expert you know when there's a new thing like for instance I'm an expert at audio and podcasting. I've been doing it since 2006. I'm really good at it. And the stuff we do is some of the best stuff out there quality wise, not just the audio, but the content, according to a lot of people. I started the Anarchy Gumbo podcast many months ago. I haven't put a sing. I haven't put ads on it at all. I haven't tried to sell ads mm-hmm. on it. Uh, you know, I think but it, I, it helps the fiends though. It brings people to the yeah, fiends. It brings yeah. new audience members. Yeah. Um, but can you it's, imagine it's a diversity thing? Too. I mean, you know, the guy doing this cartoonist thing, a lot of other people doing the same thing, don't have an audience yet. And they're saying, we need money to do this for something that doesn't cost money to do, which you could get people to do and be a team leader and herd cats. Uh, he's trying to raise money to pay for it. And God knows what else he's going to do with the money. But um, I mean, I'm not saying he's well, going to like... It costs something to do the work, but you don't have to fund that with Federal Reserve notes or even right. silver. Yeah. You can fund it with volunteer work. People can volunteer yeah. their time and effort. You know, can you imagine if like, you know, we'd been doing The Fiends for a year, a y- over a year, and then all of a sudden I said, I'm going to start an interview show called Anarchy Gumbo, but I need, a, you know, I need $1,000 in donations before I'm even going to do my first yeah. interview. Well, why, then, why have the middleman, right? I mean, if, if you need money to pay people to do your work uh, and you're, you're asking and begging for people to give you the money so you can pay the people to do work, how about just cut out the middleman and beg the people to do the work? You'd ask people to donate yeah. their efforts instead of donate their money yeah. so you can pay I mean, people money, to do money didn't even enter into Anarchy Gumbo. What happened was it was the middle of the night. I was bored and restless. I called Ben Stone at 3.30 in the morning my time. He was just getting up because he's, you know, he's Amish and has to get up and milk the cows. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was like, hey, I think I want to start a new podcast. Can I interview you tonight? And he's, he's like, okay. And I said, let's do a double ender. And he's like, what's that? And I explained it to him. And, uh, and I said, wait, why don't you go like have your coffee and wake up and I'm going to go build the website. So I went and like, you know, spent an hour building the website for Anarchy Gumbo and writing Mm -hmm. the description of it and setting up the website and then called him back and interviewed him. And that was how it started. There was, there was no, like, this won't happen if no one gives me money. Yeah. I should have charged or, him. Or the Freedom the Fiends blog. I, I pitched it to you one Saturday. And, and you're I said, like, no, no, no. And I pitched it again. And I pitched it again. You're like, all right, cool. It's a good idea. I'm convinced. And the website was done in a few hours. 
Because I then, did and then, it. And, and then by the next day, you had emailed a bunch of people, and they volunteered their time to write guest posts. And I think it's it almost this giant collaborative effort, and it got done just like that. I think it's almost more popular than the Fiends podcast at this point. It's getting there. <laughs> Well, as far as like page views, but that's because I think people listen to us through podcatchers and iTunes and Stitcher more than, you know, you know what else I hate? You know what else I, you know what else I hate? What is people who do activism knowing they could probably get arrested and then beg for, for bail? Yeah. You think they should set that bail aside? Yeah. And like, Ian, like common says, show Ian, money becomes bail. <laughs> Ian is set, has set up a thing for that, which I dig too. But I just think like, I've seen people do it and get arrested and then like hammer their friends. Like, you know, I live and die in jail without you kind of thing. It's your fault. You're in jail. Well, not your fault, but you knew you went into it knowing that that was a risk. Yeah. The only person I've ever uh, hedged, hedged your risks on that and had some money saved up for bail. Yeah. Which is how they did in the sixties. They had bail funds set up, but, uh, and it's what Ian's doing. And the only person Good. I've chipped in or we've chipped in for bail was Jillian, but she wasn't doing activism. She was just living her life, you know, and that's that's an ex- extraordinary circumstance. She was just taking a road trip, man, daily business and stuff. The things people do in the summertime, drive across the country. I mean, she got knocked for, for going about her daily life. Yeah, I guess my uh, my bottom line with this and, you know, it sounds cheesy to like shuck my books, but uh, you know you can download them if you don't want to buy them. Download uh, thirty dollars film school, thirty dollars music school, thirty dollars writing school, or get yeah. Them. It was kind of funny looking at the thread between you and uh, one of these voluntarious <laughs> beggars. Oh, you're I like, told you like to... stop begging for money. Buy my book. Buy no, my book. <laughs> no, no, I was like stop begging for money and go on YouTube and watch yeah, my you movie. Were like, watch it for free. DIY yeah. or Die: How to harassing. Survive as an Independent Artist, which is you know actually like there was somebody who. Um, at one point said that they should take my $30 film school, $30 writing school, and $30 music school and bundle it for sale with the DVD of DIY or Die, How to Survive as an Independent Artist and call it $99 Art School. Nice. That's a, that's a really good idea. So yeah. I should do that. I, I couldn't get my publisher to do it. I mean, my publisher yeah. on those books are... Uh, um. It's C- Cienage. Uh, I for there's so many like c- they've changed the name of the company and sold to the Arabs like eight times since <laughs> I started writing for them. I still get checks. Lousy but, Arabs. <laughs> well, to an Arab company, but they ha- that company it's Thompson Publishing. They're one of the biggest uh-huh. textbook publishers in America, or the yeah, biggest. Yeah. They also, if you go to Cop Lock, they have lots of ads on. I mean, not Cop Lock, Police One, the anti Cop Lock, the cop uh, cops are great site run opposite, by cops. Yeah, there's lots of ads on there for a really expensive software program that you if you're a cop you buy with taxpayer money made by that company thompson um that is for combing through social media to look for illegal activity Ugh. i'm never gonna work for them Ugh. again i'll still cash their yeah. checks because hey i did the work and they changed i didn't change you know yeah so but, I'll still but cash yeah you, them. Sh- you should stop playing in that band i've quit that band yep. yeah exactly. so my whole final thing is like you know, being a team leader for artists is like herding cats. And I've written books and done movies on how to herd those cats. But it's like, as time has gone by, my projects have involved fewer and fewer humans, mostly just Nima. Uh, Cause he's the <laughs> one guy that, you know, doesn't make me cry from working with him. Although I'm I still, the one guy that you can yell at and I'll be like, yes, cool, man. Okay. I'll do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you can I yell know. at me and I'm like, all right, man, whatever. I know. Do we have like some weird, like subtle S and M kind of relationship? I don't know. I hope not. No, it's just that I'm really laid back, so we mesh well together. Yeah, because um, yeah. you're really the opposite of laid back. <laughs> I do motivate you, but like you, you, you know, do. you can even when you're not in the same room with me, you can see the vein pulsing in my forehead <laughs> when I'm motivating yeah. you. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not it's not good for me. And you know, I'm gonna die at seven at sixty two of a heart attack, and then you'll be stuck to carry on our work. Shit. Yeah, I'm gonna have another round of kids when I'm ninety five. I know, I know. <laughs> you'll be like Michael should have smoked pot. I told him. <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> but learning that motivating artists and being a team leader is something is like herding cats is something you have to find out from experience. It's also why I've made myself a jack of all trades. It's like on my first two movies, I paid what I paid an editor. I didn't like having to, it wasn't the paying him. It was the, uh, having to like work on their schedule and like, you know, have discussions with them. And like, so I just learned to edit. I learned to edit with you on on the guns and weed movie and my latest movie which had a budget of 206 dollars i did all the editing on and it's probably technically it's probably the best movie i've ever done and interestingly when i posted it on imdb 
Uh, I filled out all the stuff. It's really complicated to get something on IMDb, and I've done it, you know, for five movies now. Um, when I did it, it got a, uh, you know, like certain things are will be rejected, and you have to fix them. Oh, the budget? Yeah, yeah the budget. Like, it, I got this autoresponder back thing that said, uh, $206 seems too low. Are you sure that's the budget? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it obviously cost you more in time than that, so. Oh, yeah. But, but it didn't cost you that much in actual. It didn't cost me that much notes. in time either because I've gotten really good with my time. I mean, we spent yeah. a year and a half really on guns and weed. I spent three weeks of planning on the gun training DVD, three days of shooting and three weeks of editing. And it was off to yeah. the printer and like not just editing, but like writing the copy for it, making the one sheet promo, you know, doing the cover, making the cover, making the yeah. layout files. Yeah. You know, I've learned, I've learned to do all that. I don't do it as well as like, you know, uh, like the Muslim agorist, Davi, you know, he's an expert mm -hmm. with, with like page layout and Photoshop and stuff. Like, you know, I could have paid him some money to do the, the cover and it would have been 30% better. But I just, I didn't have the money for it. I didn't feel like doing it. So I just did it myself and it's pretty good, yeah. but it's not yeah, great. Why not? Why not? Have you seen I, that movie? I'm, I'm totally of that philosophy. I uh, I do the same stuff. And if I don't know how to do something, but I feel my art requires it, all I do is go to YouTube and type yeah. it in, and yeah. somebody else is showing me literally yeah. step by step yeah. how to do it. Especially in a world where software can do pretty much anything that an artist used to do, uh, if you program it correctly and and tell it to do the right things. Yeah. Uh, I'll, just just go to YouTube, figure it out, man. It's not have hard. you seen Have you seen the gun training DVD yet? It's it's literally on my DVD player waiting to be watched. <laughs> you know, I was gonna say I, I've like, been busy. I I I got my little part time job, and I was like, yeah, it's just gonna be part time for now. But uh, we we would like a lot of money this month, so um, I'm working six days this week. Yeah, uh, so give us donations, or the fiends <laughs> live and die with you. Right, that's obviously a joke. I don't care. It's at night, and I enjoy doing it. Uh, so if we don't get sixty dollars, we don't get sixty dollars in the next hour. I'm throwing all the. I'm, I'm taking all the equipment out and throwing it in the trash. It's trash day, and I'm just going to throw it all away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um. I think micro donations might be a good way to go too. If every fiend wants to give us a dollar a month, that would be great. Not like we're charging you for it, but yeah. hey, one dollar yeah. literally. If you if you listen to the fiends, you know every episode or or once a week, think of it as a gumball you get in the machine as you walk outside of the grocery store. And that and that would be and it would deal. be like five thousand six thousand bucks a month, which would we could That'd quit our day hate. jobs. But Hell, you could. know what's more reasonable, and I would I would really appreciate. I'd like it if people did that, but I, I mean, we do have a thing that's set up for a $3 minimum donation uh, a month automatically. You can mm -hmm. do that. But uh, what I would really like is if some people did that and other people just went and reviewed us everywhere they could, iTunes, um, Amazon, blogs, et cetera, and started torrenting us because the torrenting is more important. You know, we don't live or, we don't live or die with the donations, but there may come a time where what we're doing is shut down even though it's legal now technically and it's technically covered by the first amendment of the United States constitution, that thing is out the window, man. And it's just a matter of time before they start going door to door, not for guns, but for free speech or both. And when we are droned, you know, when we're thrown in some camp or even just like stopped with an injunction of like, you're going to go to prison if you keep doing this, or we're going to, you know, take your house or whatever. Um, if we stop doing it, uh, if everybody has already downloaded it on BitTorrent, even if they're not sharing it yet, if they have it in their BitTorrent, they can just flip a switch. They could just all turn on BitTorrent when that happens and it will not go away. Yep, yep. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, although I would not stop if they gave me an injunction. You would have to you don't have a my house. mouth shut you don't to have get a house me to stop yet. talking. I don't have a house and I'm younger and I understand that and that's fine if you would I mean I, I I don't blame anybody for wanting to stop in those cases. And I am a real laid back person, except when somebody is aggressing on me from uh from authority, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. stepdads, teachers, uh, <laughs> cops, cops telling judges. me to not throw snowballs, get snowballs in their faces. <laughs> I, I it's like a, a switch gets flipped in me and I go into like this Hulk smash mode. Um, <laughs> so, well, so yeah, if they if they put an injunction on, I would probably podcast every day. I'd be like yeah. whatever. And I'm not saying the way to me is through my house. If you threaten to take my house, I'll stop. I'll do whatever you want. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying my stakes are probably bigger, but um yeah. No, man, my, my wife is so adamant about free speech and being able to do what people should be able to do. She'd join me on the fight. You know, yeah. she'd, she'd mm -hmm. put up the house to hire the lawyers to fight. 
<laughs> and and I would not hire Mark Stevens. <laughs> I'd hire to Gary. Go there. You, I'd hire not, Gary. Like, I didn't have enough beef in this cast. I know. Today, huh? I know. Well, I'm on a diet, struggles. man. I'm on a diet. When you're on a <laughs> diet, your body effing hates you, and I want beef. No, I would hire Gary Spence. You know who he is? You're, you're on an all beef diet. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who Gary Spence is? Uh, no, I know who Gary Sinise is. No, Gary Spence is uh. He's he's in Jackson, Wyoming. He's he's like uh, incredibly famous for let's see, American trial lawyer, re widely recognized as one of the greatest trial lawyers of all time, member of the American Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. He states that he has never lost a criminal case either as a prosecutor or defense attorney, and he's not lost a civil case since 1969. And actually, wow. he's semi-retired, and he's wealth more wealthy than god but he's in wyoming and he's very much uh i would call him if i was in a case of like first amendment crap you know i think nice. he'd i don't know if he'd take it free but i think he'd look at it and talk to and you know it's like my wife's a paralegal for a lawyer uh you know most people calling gary spence would get put through to a bunch of people but if she if i hired my wife's law firm you know, she could call on behalf and say, hey, I'm calling from the law firm of blah, blah, blah. And she could actually get him on the phone. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. yeah um, are we done with uh, voluntary? He, he did the Karen Silkwood case, man. Karen you know who Karen Silkwood. Silkwood is? No. They made man. a movie about her, man. Uh, what's it called? It's called Silkwood. Um, she was she was like finding the dirt about some nuclear power plant, you know, doing things that were incredibly dangerous to people. And she got like run off the road and murdered by their thugs yeah. or by somebody's thugs. And then Gary Spence yeah. handled the case. That's the kind of stuff he takes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's a muckety muck. And he says, uh, at one point he saw, you know, in 1952, he started his career in Riverton, Wyoming and became a successful defense ah. attorney for the insurance industry. Years later, Spence said he saw the light and became committed to representing people instead of corporations, insurance companies, banks, or big business. All right. So I'm going to just say right now, Gary Spence is going to be my attorney. When I'm going I'm to try to get Gary Spence to be my attorney. You, you've and got him on imagination retainer. He's in Wyoming. I do. I have him on imagination. <laughs> you got to see a picture of him, man. He's like, like cowboy does he look like a lawyer he looks like a cowboy lawyer oh he, he looks like matt mead's uh campaign photos no he's older and <laughs> and uh more genuinely rugged okay. he's probably sued matt mead i don't know he seems like he would have screw matt mead <laughs> gary Spence. i didn't say it i didn't say it yeah yeah i did i did what you gonna do what you gonna do matt mead yeah yeah um, he, wrote, he wrote a book it's called the making of a country lawyer Oh, okay. He's got a cowboy is, hat. Is he the one who invented that phrase? Nah, I'm just a simple country lawyer. <laughs> I'm just a simple country lawyer. Probably. <laughs> Probably. That's funny. Country yeah. lawyer. Let's look that up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, From man. freedom to slavery. My imaginary lawyer can beat up your injunction. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I see him. He's got, he's got fringes on his jacket. Yeah. He's got a buckskin jacket with fringes and a cowboy hat. And he looks like he could kick your ass. And he's like 70. Although he's eight, he's like 83, he looks man. He's 83. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. old. That's old. But not too old, man. You can be old and still cool. It, it can happen. It's yeah. possible. I'll grant it. He I'll did allow lose. It. He did lose. I'll I'll allow it, but keep it tight. <laughs> um, he did lose one criminal case, but prevailed upon appeal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So kind of like a spare instead of a strike, <laughs> but not an asterisk. No. No. Yeah. Um. So how long till the next time we have to sell stuff? Do we want to sell stuff now, or do you want to run through? Because I've got something that you wanted to talk about. But skeet, skeet, skeet. Who will build the loads? <laughs> that's what Topher said. Oh, Topher, Topher. That's great. I love it. Skeet, skeet. He's like, I never heard that term, skeet. Thanks for turning me on to it. Skeet, 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 skeet. Who skeet. will build the loads? I thought that was like a club standard. If you've been to any club ever, they play the Little John song where he goes, till we all skeet, skeet, motherfucker. I don't know. Um, Let's go sell skeet, some skeet, stuff. Skeet, skeet, skeet. Let's go sell some Little John records. What does freedom mean? Tune in to LRN.FM to find out. LRN.FM is the Liberty Radio Network, a collection of live talk radio and podcasts, all coming from a principled pro-liberty perspective. LRN.FM show hosts aren't left, right, or conspiracy kooks. 
You can tune in 24-7 to LRN.FM via your phone, computer, satellite, and more. Listen free anytime at LRN.FM. That's LRN.FM. Gun Training with the Non-Aggression Principle, Volume 1. Basic Handgun and Rifle with Jared Waltz. First rule of being alive is you own yourself. A groundbreaking approach to firearms and self-defense training. Beautifully filmed and easy to understand instructions make this one a must-have. Gun Training with the Non-Aggression Principle, Volume 1. New DVD from Michael W. Dean. Available on Amazon. Your house is in Have you swallowed too much of the state's poison? The Freedom Fiends will stick their fingers down your throat and hold your hair back while you hurl. Check out the new show, The Freedom Fiends Agenda, on Adam Curry's No Agenda Global Radio. Streaming live every Thursday from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. East Coast U.S. time. Listen live at nagradio.com. That's nagradio.com. Call in soon before they get droned. Yeah, this is the last one here, uh, last one of this episode. Um, there is a small chance this one's going to get inter- interrupted by men coming to my door. Ooh, what kind of men? Men in hats? Pl- plumbers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. We actually need to spend like between seven and ten grand and have them dig up the concrete in the back patio and fix the uh, the pipe going out to the city sewage pipe. So until we have the money to do that... Um, are you sure? Maybe it's the central poopenheiser. No, it's so absolutely we've, we've, that. We've been having problems too. Uh, our sink was backflowing. Like the sink, our kitchen sink would be empty, and then the next morning, both sinks were completely full. Like water was going. Yeah, backwards. we got that in the basement, but it's uh, it's not just water. It's kind of dark colored. Let's just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically, what it's it is is with water. these with these old houses, they actually made the sewage pipe out of tar paper before Ooh. before PVC plastic, and um. Uh-huh. It worked pretty well. It was like ro- layers and layers of it. It's like, you know, half an inch thick of tar paper. But it, it's past its, its yeah. lifetime. So uh, about once okay. a year, we have to get the plumbers to come root out. It's not Roto-Rooter, but it does what they do. They they come and like get up on the roof and uh, snake it out, you know, with a, with a snake that has a camera on it so they can see, you know, 100 feet away mm-hmm. where the blockage mm-hmm. is. So i'm glad we're mm. gonna get done right now because the, the snow thawed it's above freezing right now it's a bitch we had them last year come like, like a colonoscopy for your house it is it is we had them come <laughs> last year like in the winter up on i, I felt sorry for them they're up on the roof in the snow in the wind wow. in the cold like yeah that's a shitty day <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they're coming between two and four so i don't know when that okay. is we'll see okay it's okay. almost two so yeah you want to talk about something what is it ip horror in the supreme court yeah, man. Uh, you sent this to me. I, I didn't realize what it was at first. Um, but apparently there's a, the Supreme Court's hearing a case that could change the way you resell things. So we always talk about IP with regard, usually on this cast. To original uh, sale. Well, also to media. Um, to media, you you basically own it and what you do with it at, at this point. Um but according to the article, and, th- and they did put this really simply, I'm going to just quote the article's two paragraphs to sum up what's going on here. Um, they say, put simply, though Apple has the copyright on the iPhone and Mark Owen does own does own the copyright on the book No Easy Day, you can still sell your copies to whom- whomever you please, whenever you want, without retribution. That's being challenged now for products that are made abroad. If the Supreme Court upholds an appellate court ruling, it would mean that the copyright holders of anything you own that has been made in China, Japan, Europe, uh, would have to get you'd have to get permission from the original makers in order to sell it. This would end flea markets. It would end library, you know, book sales. It would well, they'd probably have an exception because they're the government, but um, it would end. Uh, it would put mom and, the few remaining mom and pop used bookstores out of, out of you know. It would screw everything. Uh, it well, would, yeah, pawn shops. Uh, yeah. I mean, Craigslist, eBay. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was something especially that, with music gear. I mean, think of where music gear is built. It's probably mostly built in China. It all, and it all has patents. It all has trademarks. It all, this only mentioned copyright, but I'm assuming it also covers patents and trademarks. I mean, because um, like, yeah, there, it, there's not really a copyright on an iPhone. There's a bunch right. of patents. There's probably copyrights on some of the software, but, um, and, and if not, then it's just a small step. To, to take the yeah. next step. Um, and yeah, I mean, 
when we talk about IP, that's one of the things is once you own something, nobody can tell you what to do with it. For instance, if I buy a CD, I now own that CD. I can do anything I want with it. Nobody else has a claim on it if I bought it outright, right? I mean, yeah. it's in my possession. I own it. Uh, so this not only flies in the face of that, but it takes it a step further saying that, yeah, if you ever try to sell it, uh, you, you don't have the right to do that unless you pay some sort of remittance to these people and, and basically how would they enforce that without like shutting down high literally? high pro high profile bust of flea markets and used bookstores and then right, chilling right. effect yeah. um and this is being decided by the supreme court and it's one of those things that like nobody knew about and it's kind of under the you know they're trying to do it so you don't know about it and i also thought it. um what what actually made the case happen like the reason the case is is in the supreme court uh i thought it was a beautiful example of free enterprise making items cheaper for consumers uh, and of course the state the corporate state trying to stop that so the case stemmed from a guy uh, I guess his name is Supop Kurt Seng I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly um, he's from Thailand and he came to America in 97 uh, he was studying at Cornell University, and he realized that his textbooks uh, were uh, yeah. so much cheaper to buy in Thailand than they were in New York. So he got all his relatives to Thailand to buy the cheap books, ship them to him, and then he sold them, making tons of money for himself and also providing a service to people, right? All these people that he sold the books to, they got they had more money to spend on food or clothes or college tuition. There was more opportunity cost. There was less money wasted on things like trade agreements and protectionist schemes that the state does. So the world was actually made wealthier by him doing this free market activity. And this is also a great example to tell stinky liberals about how the free market helps poor people by making goods cheaper, right? <laughs> stinky liberals. Well, it's it's true, isn't it? I mean, yeah. The, yeah, the company is complaining because the company lost money, but the company was screwing people over by charging them too much money. This guy, who was just some some college kid, uh, he, through the profit motive because it would make him money, realized a way to make a good cheaper for people. That's how prices go down. Yeah, and you know, really, what this is is applying a government model to copyright even more so yep. than already. Because, I mean, think about originally taxes in America. I mean, I don't like any taxes, but they have changed for the worst by far uh, over the years. When they originally started, the only taxes were on corporations and individuals were not taxed. Then they added an, an, an income, which is basically constitutional. And then they unconstitutionally added an income tax. And then they states added sales taxes. And now everything is taxed at every level where originally it was only taxed originally you know like you buy something from the original manufacturer or from the re original retailer and you pay a tax you make money on you make you know the corporation makes money and you pay tax on it now think about how money is taxed at every point you know yep. if if i buy if if i buy a guitar effects pedal from you that, that you bought you know you're the fourth owner on it i'm still supposed you're still supposed to pay income tax on that sale or sales tax you sales know? tax yeah really yeah. yeah i guess you are but that's you're taxed every ridiculous. time every time money changes hands you're technically supposed to pay for it and that and, and think about how that raises the cost of goods and yeah. the cost of doing yeah. business because you're paying all of that i mean i don't know what the numbers are but i wouldn't be surprised if 40 percent to half of the costs of any good are are taxes at various levels also or minimum wage you know tax various government intrusions that have added to the cost of goods and you know it's really funny how stinky liberals uh and stinky conservatives or ba well-bathed conservatives think that um that uh, raising taxes to pay for all of the things they want to do good is good and they feel like someone else is going to pay for it. The poorest people in America pay tax all the time, even if they've never filled out a tax form. You know, you buy a candy bar, you're paying sales tax, but you're also paying the tax on the trucking company that brought it, the store that sells it, the company that made it, the company that sold each of the ingredients to that company. Uh, and a dozen other things along the way, man. The you're paying the the tax on the electricity in the store you bought it from. Mm -hmm. You're paying when you when you take the bus to go there. You're paying your your bus price includes the city bus price includes yeah. taxes on gasoline. You know yeah. for the bus yeah. everything. 
they're they're like the most efficient mafia operation you could think of. They literally, without question, get get a cut of everything without every you even, transaction without, without you, you knowing noticing. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When exactly. you when you know renters are like, well, landlords should pay taxes and homeowners should pay taxes, but not renters. And I'm glad we don't. You pay taxes. Your rent includes taxes. Your rent includes the property, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a share of the property tax. It as well as all the licensing they had to do to get people to yeah. come inspect the property and the building codes and the, the pool license for the people who <laughs> came out and checked out the pool in the hot tub. And and the you know, the salary of the bureaucrat who studied satellite photos to find out who had a pool so they could tax them the pool tax, <laughs> which we talked about before. And you know, sometimes we say things like in passing and you're like, Yeah, that doesn't really happen. Like you said, or people will say that, or I'll say it. Um like you said, you know, in that ad, we say like for the VPN, we say, do you, do you want, do you want to surf porn in private or just be able to look at what you want to without some tech goon hired off a pizza box? And you're like, what the hell is that? What, did you make that up, Michael? That's, that's funny. And I'm like, no, the T, the, the TSA is hiring people off of, and DHS are hiring people off of ads on pizza boxes now. You'll probably see some and deliver some. Have you started that job yet? Uh, I did, yeah, uh, last night, and I had a blast, man. Um, they say you can't go home, but it felt like home. Nice. Um, I did it, you know, four years in college, same place, same locale. I still uh, remembered the whole uh, delivery area. Like, I barely had to look at a map. I would get, <laughs> like, I would get an address, and I would know in my mind exactly like where the address was. Falling off a bicycle. I could probably yes, go be exactly. a bike messenger in San Francisco now. You know, 18 years later and, and do the and same thing. And still remember where the addresses are. Although, I, yeah. although I'd be huffing and puffing more than I was back then. <laughs> yeah. What does it say on the pizza box? Is it, On your pizza box, is it a TSA ad? Hell no. Hell is no. It, is no. it like in Futurama where it has the Italian guy smiling? Don't, don't tip the driver. <laughs> don't tip the driver. <laughs> uh, oh, no. No, luckily it does not. Um no man, uh tips at this location are are really good. Uh I worked 4 hours yesterday and I made um I made $40 in tips alone and then you get $13. I got $13 for gas uh in addition to minimum wage. So, if you just count my tips it was $10 an hour. Plus I get $7 an hour for minimum wage and uh like a buck something for every run nice. I take for gas. So, it's 17 bucks an hour for 4 hours and and that's nice. that's average. So, it's a it's a decent way to to work at night, not interfere with the fiends, and make money for uh, new turntables and a camera and uh, audio equipment to make the fiends better and to make my art uh, easier to produce. So before we go into talking about how Facebook is trying to shut down the fiends, I want we have a correction. Um, someone wrote in. For your information, I'm listening to the Thursday Fiend Show RBN. We were talking about that um, radio station getting shut down. Uh, ah, you know, the sovereign right. citizen stuff. Uh, and we RBN, were getting our info from Wikipedia as we often right. do. <laughs> and they said RBN is a decent station. That whole sovereign citizen stuff was on the wiki, intentionally skewed to make RBN look bad. Sam Kennedy was a host on RBN that teamed up with Tim Turner, who I believe is a fed snitch. That's what someone sent me. <laughs> you know, I can believe that. I remember when I interviewed Lark and Rose, and I was like asking him about something uh and i was like yeah i got that from your wiki page and he's like yeah the wiki page is wrong because people hate me yeah um so yeah and uh i could definitely see that um i mean I, i'm glad you included that comment i'm not sure if i'm going to go do any kind of independent research on rbn because i don't feel like it affects me that much but um <laughs> but i comment ju- duly noted thank yeah, you yeah duly noted one. and um you know, you're nobody until somebody wants to censor you, which uh, le- leads too. to our Wikipedia yep. or, or our Facebook thing recently. Somebody posted a link to uh, our video. Uh, was it? it was Freedom of Ingestion, which is oh yeah, Great you video. know, me playing music and you rapping about how the government should stay out of your weed and your guns. And it's when you around. taught me uh, what a Mixolydian mode was, yeah. and I, I learned that. And, <laughs> it's uh, it's the one mode that's different going up than down. And yep. Dick Dale uses a lot of Mixolydian loads uh, modes. I could see that. Yep, they, they yeah. sound they sound Middle they Eastern, sound ancient. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, so when when I clicked on this link, Facebook gave me a security alert that said, 
the link you're trying to visit, and this link was YouTube, which YouTube you can click with impunity. A real YouTube link is never going to be yeah. viral or mess with you Because it's YouTube. Up. Right. I mean, it's it's like number two Google rank. Google yeah. owns it, and it's yeah. Alexa ranking is like three or something. Maybe this is Facebook trying to fuck F with the competition. But uh, no, I think it's a bunch of people or several people complained and marked it viral when it, you know, like a virus viral, when it wasn't to try to censor us. Because you get a security alert when you click on that link on Facebook that says, you know, it's got a big like exclamation point in a triangle security alert. The link you are trying to visit has been classified as potentially abusive by a Facebook partner. <laughs> to learn more about staying safe on the internet, visit Facebook's security wow. page. Please also read the Wikipedia articles on malware and phishing. And then there's a McAfee logo, McAfee antivirus, and it says, to stay safe outside of Facebook, get the free McAfee Site Advisor plugin. So, uh, so they're this, spamming you. They're spamming spam. you. Yeah, wow, they're trying to scare wow. you with something that's not scary, telling you you need their product to buy their product. Ugh, ridiculous, man. Well, you know, the video is abusive. It's abusive towards the state. Abuse. It's, it's abusive it's, towards it's, abuse, man. It's abusive towards abuse. Yeah, that's a good it's way self to put defense. It. It's abusive self it's a self defense at abuse. Yes, yes. And it's a wonderful video. I, I do encourage you to check it out. If if you didn't get to click on it because Facebook was being a butt, uh just go check it out. Google or YouTube Freedom of Ingestion. Um, it's the concept of, uh, you know, you have the right to decide what goes into your freaking body. And if the Founding Fathers uh, could have foreseen, I don't think they, they even imagined something as tyrannical as a drug war. Something as tyrannical as the government deciding what goes in your body. They never could have envisioned that level of government. I mean, I think I think it would violate a bunch of the amendments of the constitution and the bill of rights including one that's not talked about much which is quartering soldiers i mean they're not being quartered in houses but they're basically on full-time salary ah, being quartered right. in the community i never thought in, of that. in a way that the founders never wanted a standing army or a standing police force but but they call it a drug war and the police force Persecu pro uh, the, the police force is the one who fights this drug war, right. and they live in your town. Uh, you pay for their housing, so you're yeah, quartering you're them. Quartering them. You're yeah. right. That's that's great. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I hate it, but I love that connection that you made. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. thanks. Uh, we should use that more. Which which amendment is the quartering of soldiers? Is it the fourth? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, quartering. We're, we're, we're not really constant. We don't really, you know. I learned all that, and I've had to forget it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, there was actually, there's the Bill actually, of Rights, it's like, oh, that's cute. Now, here's real freedom. <laughs> there, it's the Third Amendment, man. It's it's that important. It Amendment. was like gun, free yeah. speech, guns, and no quartering of soldiers. And actually, there's a, um Onion piece that I think was it's a video that I think was making fun of Second Amendment people that it was uh, it was an interview with someone from it was a lobbyist group in in DC that was supposed to be protecting the Third Amendment and it was mm -hmm. like well no one's quartering soldiers yet but they could happen anytime and it was supposed to be like ridiculous but I'm like I think it you're, could happen I think you're right no I I, I, say I think it is happening I think it is happening I think we should we should pimp that more um, we should, because because that helps people to understand what's going on with police forces now and what's going on with the drug war. Uh, let's be Third Amendment advocates for a little bit. Let's put on our little constitutionalist <laughs> hats and and let's let's explain to people that hey, if you're a constitutionalist, <laughs> the cops are basically quartered soldiers. I, I think that might be a better title for this. The cops <laughs> are the <laughs> the drug war violates the third. I don't know. I'll figure it out, but uh, or put okay. it in there somehow. But yeah, that is okay. something to point out. I mean, you're quartering them with your tax money and your your property tax or your rental part of your rental money, whatever. You're quartering them as your neighbors. Yep. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And quartering, if you don't know, is a kind of slightly archa archaic term that means having to allow them in your home. Uh, right. Right. You know, in that was one thing that the founders hated about the king was that in England and in America, you know, since they didn't have barracks or they didn't have, you know, place to put the soldiers, they'd put them in your home. Soldiers could knock on your door and say, Hey, I need your spare room, a meal, and maybe your daughter. <laughs> Literally. I'm not kidding. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Well, um, it's like in, in RPGs, you know, role playing games, uh, on video game systems, uh, how you, you're usually a soldier in some medieval time and you just walk into people's houses and talk to them and like steal out of their cabinets. Um, and that's just the norm. 
<laughs> yeah. So maybe maybe that that's where it stems from. Yeah. Whereas you know when there's when there's a, a resistance army, people who support the resistance will often quarter people voluntarily. Although and then, then kill them? you know no, not kill them. No, let them. I oh, mean, court, court of the the rebel army. Yeah, voluntarily. yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that happened in the American Revolution, and that happens all over the world. But you know, you also risk like tre- treason charges and being hanged for giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I think that the government is giving aid and comfort to the enemy by stealing our money and quartering this occupation army of you know fed goon drug warriors. Yeah, I think you're right, but. Uh... I think the government is also the enemy. So uh, to them, they obviously don't see it that way. They're really unpleasant. I'll say that. They're really unpleasant. <laughs> okay. You're trying to be diplomatic there. So we're about out here. I got I have this, this funny thing that kept coming to my mind the other day. It was like, I have this image of some band rocking out in the studio. And then the producer walks in and he's looking at his iPhone or his Blackberry and he goes, uh, stop, 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 stop. Okay, sorry. Your style of music just now went passe. Thank, thank you for your help, but please go back to your old jobs now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Why can't we do that with the Occupation Army too? Ah, oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're sick of uh, paying traffic tickets and being thrown in cages and beaten up and tased and uh, sick of worrying about being drones. So why don't you guys just go get productive <laughs> well, work? you know, I often go back to that at a Grateful Dead show in the parking lot, some white hippie getting arrested for selling weed. Oh, and the Jamaican off by two guy cops. just shaming the, the cops. And the Jamaican shot guy yeah. following the tall, big, in, imposing, dreadlocked Jamaican dude in tie-dye screaming at the cops and saying like, Hey man, why don't you stop doing what you're doing? You come down to my office Monday morning. I give you honest work give selling incense. Honest work, honest yes. work selling incense. I can't do the accent, but uh, it's, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. That, I love how he used that term "honest work" too, because yeah. yep, I don't know if that. I can think of a more dishonest, uh, on its face profession than police work. I mean, literally, and specifically, they're, they're taught and speci- to lie to people so and they specific, can get them to incriminate themselves. Specifically, drug police work. I mean, specific. Yeah, you know, right, I'm not right. going to. I'm not that, going to make a lie. I'm not going to make a case for uh, cops or do some good, but it's like, okay. Some cops occasionally do something good. Drug cops never do anything good. Mm-hmm. Their whole thing is based on theft, fraud, aggression, murder, you know, kidnapping. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and they make TV shows about it now. You know what? I bashed how there's all these new shows out that are cop shows, and I was talking about oh the god, there's even one called Homeland now about Homeland Security. Mm. It's it's really good. <laughs> it's a really good oh, TV dude. show, man. I hate it. I hate it. It stars. It's good, it, it's good. It's good because it's critical of Homeland Security. No, or it's good because it's, it's good well drama, man. It's well written, well acted, well written, well acted. Okay. and it stars uh, Claire Danes, who was you know I've liked her oh, since I my so-called her. life. I hate her. Ah. I hate her. She's she's good. She she plays she plays a scared, crazed woman really well, and she does that in this as a Homeland Security agent. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Know. I never liked her. Yeah, I mean the episode I saw took place like you know following Hezbollah and shooting them in uh really was Hezbollah in America I hope not no no not in America <laughs> okay. no 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 and they were in uh Beirut the, those Lebanon. damn tourists they were in Lebanon which you know when I think of Lebanon I think of Dick Dale I don't I don't want to think of bad things <laughs> happening there you go you should tell that to Dick Dale when I think well of Lebanon, I'm gonna I think of you I think Israel I'm killing a bunch of here's kids. how I want to segue into politics with Dick Dale he's he's half Lebanese and half Russian and I want to be like uh you know you are basically of the two parts of the world that America has hated. You know, they hated Russia in the sixties and seventies and, or, and, and now they, they hate the Middle East. You know, what, what well, would you he, do? Is he a Christian, uh, Lebanese person? Cause Lebanon has a lot of Christians too. I don't know what his religion is. I'm going to ask him that too. I'm guessing it's kind of some kind of hippie spiritualist surfer thing, but, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. and he does, sir, he did surf unlike the beach boys who just pretended to, um, or most of them did. But he also says he doesn't surf now because there's too much mercury in the water worldwide. He says he's going to start snowboarding. But um, I want to ask yes. him I want to ask him what he thinks could make peace in the Mideast because I, I think that would be a good question. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the picture on Wikipedia of him performing is in a rest, he's performing at a club called the Middle East Restaurant Here's in the Cambridge. In the East, I've, I've played in the Middle East Restaurant. I, uh, um, I tried to hit the drummer from the band Pavement in the head with my bass <laughs> at, that, at that show. 
That's and my nice sister was there, you. and my sister was like horrified, like this is what you do. But you we were people we were, with your guitar. The guy was drunk. He, we we opened for him, and he was really uh, drunk. And he tried to come up on stage and start playing my drummer's drums while we were playing. Like you know, grabbed cymbals, like grabbed sticks, and started hitting on his cymbals off beat. So, so, so you had to pull an Adam Kokesh. Well, I pushed him away, and he came back. Yeah, I I, I swung a bass guitar at him that would have put him in the hospital if it hit him, but he kind of swerved. He staggered out of the way accidentally before it hit him. <laughs> did Did he stop? Did he get the message? Yeah, one of or, his one of his band back? members, my friend Rob Cum, uh, Chamberlain, who played in Pavement. Um. Uh, kind of led him off to the stage and I think bought him another okay. beer. And then they played and they were really bad because their drummer was really drunk. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's probably a bell curve uh, when it comes to drummers and intoxicants. <laughs> well, yeah, You're probably better if you've got a few in you, but you're probably a lot yeah. worse if you've got too many. It's a thin line. It's a thin line. As David Lee Roth said, man, you got to craft your buzz. And on that you note... craft your buzz. Dick Dale, <laughs> no, is a big, Dick Dale is a big influence on Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen has said yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I asked this Dale, Dick Dale if if the Middle East crisis would be solved by having everybody do uh, rap battles or guitar playing. <laughs> well, you know, I actually actual I actually battles. asked Hubert Selby that. Uh, you know, like what what would if what, there's some what, kind of friendly competition what, for the what Gaza could, Strip? What could there be for world peace? You know, and I love Cubby's answer. Selby's answer. He said, you know, I don't know about all these politicians having talks and stuff. I think it's like. You know, I think what ended the Cold War was just just a couple of dancers going back and forth between Moscow and New York. Yeah. Because they had that ballet exchange during the Cold mm -hmm. War, you know. All right. On that note, I think we're out. Out. And peace. Worms. Hello, Freedom Beans. It's your boy, Dean. From the U.S. Get the U.S. out of the screen. I owe me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, for fact. The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com, the Liberty Radio Network, and No Agenda Global Radio. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.